Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sunita Advani, and I'm the founder and chair of SGBF, which is short for Singapore Very Young Arbitration Practitioners. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the SGBF event on international arbitration in China, a primer for junior lawyers. And I'm very much looking forward to moderating this very interesting panel discussion. So just by way of brief reintroduction for the virtual attendees who are joining us right now, with me here in the room is uh, Lee Jun Kao, uh, Chan Ling Sun SC, Brenda Horrigan, and Charles T. We'll be discussing a number of topics today. So let's start with um, how has international arbitration in China evolved? What are its key features and how do you see these developing in the future? And if we could start with Li Jin, please. Thanks to Sunita for organizing this uh, very interesting event. Uh, I think it's an excellent idea to have a very young arbitration practitioners group. Uh, this is an excellent idea. You know, uh, I think uh, maybe in China they can do, you can organize a Chinese chapter, um, uh, same thing. Uh, well, uh, I haven't been to Singapore for four, uh, almost four years. So exciting to come back here, see all the friends, and also see um, the young faces. I hope I can uh, time travel to become one of the members of the very young arbitrator practitioners. Uh, for the uh, issue of uh, involve evolution of uh, arbitration system in China, uh, I have no idea whether you are familiar with uh, the Chinese arbitration system. Uh, well, we have an uh, arbitration law um, which was promulgated in 1994 and has been there for almost 30 years without any major uh, amendments. Uh, so uh, commentators usually say that uh, there are three no's under the PRC arbitration law. Namely, there's no ad hoc arbitration. Um, no foreign institutions is allowed to conduct arbitration in China, and uh, no overseas arbitration for purely domestic disputes. Uh, that's either directly provided in the arbitration law or implied in the arbitration law. Uh, but over the almost 30 years, there have been reform, uh, but the reform is not introduced by legislation or legislators, but rather by the court. Uh, either by way of uh, court decisions or by way of uh, judicial interpretations, which are the uh, regulations by the Supreme People's Court to deal with uh, uh, various issues. Uh, so uh, at this moment, uh, ad hoc arbitration may be allowed, but only with regard to uh, you know, parties that are registered in free trade zones. Uh, foreign institutions are allowed to conduct arbitration, not only arbitration agreement calling for foreign institutions doing arbitration in China will be recognized as valid, but also uh, those uh, awards will be uh, 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 enforced under Chinese law rather than under New York Convention. Uh, the Chinese courts also accept set aside proceeding uh, to consider set aside applications for uh, ICC uh, awards rendered in China. Um, on one case, uh, Charles was involved in the arbitration stage, and now the other side is challenging uh, the award in the Beijing court uh, through this set aside application, and the Beijing court accept the case, which means this case is considered to be a domestic or Chinese local case. Uh, well, having said that, you know, uh, you may wonder uh, if those reforms are introduced by way of uh, court uh, decisions or judicial interpretation, whether there is an uh, issue uh, with uh, inconsistency or there may be a lack of uh, stability on all those issues. The good news is that uh, China is in the process of uh, amending the arbitration law. Uh, the Ministry of Justice, which is responsible for uh, uh, repairing a draft amendment. Uh, the uh, 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 publicized a draft amendment in July uh, 2021 for public consultation. Uh, and if you uh, look at the contents, uh, it's basically in line with the uh, on model law. So if this law is passed eventually, uh, that means uh, Chinese arbitration practices will be more or less in line with the model law jurisdiction uh, legislations. So which mean, which uh, is a good news or good step 
forward. Thank you. That's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Lee Jun. Lang San, would you have any comments as well? Well, yes. Well, thank you for having me here. I I wasn't old enough to make the young arbitrators group, so I'm very pleased to be in the very young arbitrators <laughs> group. And uh, well, I'll just pick up from what Lee Jun says. Certainly, arbitration in China has come a long way. It's evolved quite a lot. And if you go back to, say, the mid-1990s, there were just about 1,000 cases administered by Chinese arbitration institutions. And within a decade, that had gone up to over 100,000 cases, and now even more. And now I think you have more than 240 arbitration institutions in China, and more are coming up, I think, every, every year. Um, and over the course of the years, um, there have been initiatives, actually, to bring arbitration practice as well as arbitration um, uh, related regulations, laws, and so on in line with international practice. The Supreme People's Court, for example, some of you might know, has issued a number of notices to support arbitration. In 1995, they issued a notice that says that if any court is going to declare an arbitration agreement invalid, they have to first get approval uh, from the Supreme People's Court, but through the High Court. So there's a step process. Then in, I believe, 1998, they also uh, made a similar, uh, gave a similar notice that says that if any court, any of the lower courts, uh, want to set aside an award in a foreign-related arbitration, again, they can't do that until the process goes up the ladder uh, and the Supreme People's Court has given approval. So in, in a very, very big country like China, I think that's an important step to ensure some degree of consistency in the application of arbitration principles. Um, as uh, Dijun said, the, the arbitration law is now being revised. The revised draft um, is looking at the three notes that he mentions, and no, that might be changed. It's also looking at giving power to arbitration tribunals to render interim uh, measures in uh, orders such as injunctions, which previously have been the exclusive domain of the Chinese courts. So again, it's going to empower arbitrators. And I'll just start with just one observation before COVID. Uh, my four memories of that, going there before COVID, I haven't been back since. Was, um, just as an example of the outreach that China does um, to not just ensure that its own practices are up to date, but also to up, have an outreach to other arbitration institutions around the world. Um, there was a BRI Arbitration Institutions Forum in Beijing in 2019, hosted by CTEC. And um, they came up with a joint declaration by the arbitration institutions uh, to strengthen global arbitration practice, to have more dialogue, okay, and have more cooperation, mutual learning, and so on. That has somewhat been put on the burner because of COVID, but I'm sure that from this year onwards, we are going to, we are going to see much more action in China again. Thank you. Thank you, Ling San. Brenda? I'll keep this quite short um, because uh, we have a, a lot of things to get to. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen, I, I first moved to Shanghai in uh, 2009, uh, where I was the head of international arbitration for a European firm at the time. And I remember in 2009, almost all of our cases were brought by Western companies against Chinese companies. The Chinese companies often would not participate, or if they did participate, they were not sophisticated in, um, in their participation. And I think this goes to some, something that uh, has already been said. Fast forward to now, more than half the cases have Chinese claimants. They're very sophisticated matters. Um, they're under all sorts of um, rules. I'm sitting in, in an LCIA case at the moment that involves uh, Chinese parties um, and, and deals with Africa. So, I mean, it's just, it's all over the map. It's very sophisticated uh, and it's growing and it will keep growing. So, <clears throat> So I, I, I'll stop there, but, but I just would say it's, it's definitely an area that's exciting and growing. 
Thank you, Brenda. Just in the interest of time, we'll move on to our next question. Um, to specifically to Brenda and Charles, because you're both not originally from China, but you've both also had quite a bit of work experience in China. What drew you to practice international arbitration in China? Serendipity. Um, I, I actually started my career with a central and, Euro and Eastern European focus. Um, I spent the first 10, 15 years of my career um, based out of Moscow and Paris. And at that point, my European firm um, decided it wanted to expand in China and it needed an arbitration practitioner in China. Um, I was co-head of their uh, international arbitration practice. The other co-head was French. We were sitting in Paris. We kind of looked at each other and said, it makes no, no sense for him to move, so I'll move. Um, and thank goodness, I am very happy to be in this part of the world and not Russia and Ukraine these days. So um, sometimes the things that you think are maybe career diverting are the best things that ever happened to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that, Charles. I think I would echo exactly what uh, Brenda has said about serendipity and how sometimes, you know, like things that uh, you, you, you may not expect may, 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 may turn out very well for, for, for one. I would say for myself, what led me to China was a combination of serendipity and sage advice. And as to why that is, I would say serendipity came about through three trips that I did about seven or eight years ago. Uh, one was to Cambodia, and there I met a very interesting person who uh, piqued my interest about China, and she's now my wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first part of serendipity. Uh, part two was a trek that I did to Nepal, uh, where I did the Everest Base Camp trek, and that's a 120km trek up the mountains. And as I was on the trek, I met, uh, I met someone along the way, and this person told me that there was this chance. And there was this thing called the Chinese Government Scholarship, which I was not aware of before. And that and that com and then comes brings me to the third trip, which was to Sichuan. I spent a month uh, going around Sichuan in 2017. And at that time, I saw that there were many uh, big projects that were going on in, in China, you know, large projects, large developments, hydroelectric wind projects. And at that time, I had just finished uh, my work as an associate to Dr. Michael Huang, uh, whom I think many of you in the audience may, be, may, may know of. And, and I shared about my experiences on holiday with him. And I also shared about the information about the Chinese government scholarship that I received on, in Nepal. And, and so, uh, you know, and, and so I asked what's, what are his views about this, and he said that if he was my age, he wouldn't hesitate to, to take it. And so that's sage advice, and that ties, ties uh, my answer together, and that, has what, that, that was what uh, brought me up to China to work. And, and eventually, uh, it brought me up to PKU to do my master's, and eventually to work with Lee Chin at Zonglin. It's really very interesting. Thank you for sharing that as well. We'll move on to our next topic, which is navigating the Belt and Road Initiative. So this question is for Lee Jun and Charles. How has the Belt and Road Initiative impacted international arbitration involving Chinese parties? What are the most common disputes arising out of the Belt and Road Initiative? And what is the future outlook for the Belt and Road Initiative? Lee Jun, please. Well, the um, BRI was initiated uh, in 2013, I think uh, 10 years ago. So uh, when we talk about the BRI countries, usually um, there are disagreements about what are the countries that are BRI countries. Uh, but it's generally uh, uh, agreed that at least uh, 65 countries uh, in Central Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, uh, Middle East, and Eastern European, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, those are uh, the uh, vulnerable countries. The Chinese parties, including both SOEs, and the private companies, they have been investing heavily uh, in those countries in the past 10 years. So 70% uh, of the investment goes to energy and the infrastructure uh, sectors. Uh, so uh, in recent years, we did uh, witness uh, uh, quick growth 
in number of uh, commercial arbitrations involving uh, BRI uh, projects. So um, uh, I think uh, in, in, if you ask me the outlook, I think in the uh, next 10, 20 years, the number will continue to grow because uh, those projects are very large projects. Uh, so if you have a construction dispute, it could be a dispute between owner and uh, uh, contractor. It could be a dispute between contractor and subcontractor, etc. It could be uh, sales of goods, you know, all, all those type of cases. Uh, so I think we will continue to see those cases in the next one, two decades. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, uh, there will be uh, more and more investment or investors data arbitrations. In 2019, I think I was here for one of the events uh, and was asked uh, why uh, there have been no cases against the Bell and Road States. Uh, so I was uh, saying, you know, it takes time. And I, I use this name, Let the Bullet Fly. It's a name from a Chinese movie. Uh, so so if bullet will fly. I don't, we don't know uh, which uh, will be the easy target. I think now the bullet is about to reach the targets. Uh, and uh, in the next two or three years, we will see uh, many uh, cases brought up by Chinese investors against the Belt and Road States. So we have been consulting many times recently, so I can see the trend. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's very insightful indeed. Charles, do you have anything to add? I guess I, I would say that uh, Chinese investments, uh, I will talk about the private sector because uh, it, it's Belt and Road is not just about, uh, you know, government or government that contracts, but uh, uh, even amongst these, these there's a lot, also a lot of contracting activity between private enterprises that, uh, that uh, undertake investments out and which uh, expect returns. And that connects back to what Li Chin has said about the potential rise in investor state disputes. There will also be, I think, uh, uh, joint venture disputes, you know, investment, private equity disputes. Sometimes there will be investments and there will be investors that expect returns contractually. Uh, and we're not talking about situations of expropriation. We're just talking about situations of, of uh, contracting parties, one against another, financiers expecting returns or, uh, you know, uh, companies that perform trade manufacturing. Uh, I think you would expect that there will, with the increase in trade activity, there will also be an increase in disputes. Um, that's really interesting as well. And so, Charles, just uh, sticking with you on that point, what are the unique challenges and opportunities for junior lawyers, and specifically those in Singapore, in handling Belt and Road Initiative-related disputes? Challenges and opportunities. Okay, I'll, I'll start with opportunities. I think... Uh, the opportunities will arise because I think there are many Chinese contracts or contracts involving Chinese parties, which in from what I've seen, have selected uh, a common law governing law as their governing law. And uh, do, these would be uh, contracts governed by Hong Kong law, English law, Singapore law. And in the course of my work, I've seen uh, quite a number of these. And I think being lawyers based in Singapore with a common law background, uh, you're, you're very well placed, I think, to uh, contribute to such cases. Uh, in terms of challenges, I think in Singapore, you know, just before this panel started, we were having some discussions and I heard someone mention that uh, Singapore is quite a saturated market for arbitration. And I think maybe this is a challenge for Singapore lawyers because it's about how, how do we make uh, for, for young lawyers such as in the audience, uh, how does one make... Uh, make a, how does one chart the path in, 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 in a sector such that uh, they will be able to make a name for themselves, to be able to uh, do good work for good clients, get good work for good clients, and then do good work for these clients. And, uh, and, and, and you know, hopefully in 10, 20 years time, end up as one of these uh, very esteemed panelists that we have over here. I think that's the biggest challenge. Thank you for that. Ling San. Um, can you please share with us any practical strategies for effectively navigating Belt and Road Initiative-related disputes and mitigating risks? Um, 
Well, there are a number of risks that you wouldn't be surprised by, such as your counterparty's credit uh, risk, your and political risk, change of government, regulatory risk. But I want to focus on uh, just a couple of which might be more uh, topical. Um, and th those are risks that have come up in more modern times rather than uh, in older times. One would be the anti-money laundering requirements of many countries. So these are some things, some things that companies doing cross-border work needs to be aware of. Uh, for example, the ICBC, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, uh, and its Madrid branch was investigated by the Spanish authorities for, for uh, suspicion of violating anti-money laundering laws. The Agricultural Bank of China in New York faced a $250 million fine, and it's not limited to Chinese companies. Uh, Ban Paribas was fined several billion dollars for violating U.S. laws when what they were doing did not even violate European laws. So you just need to be aware of that. Uh, and you need to have a due compliance uh, department within your, your, um, within your company. The other risk, which is very, very uh, current, would be environmental laws, climate change uh, uh, considerations. One of our, our friends, uh, Simon Mills, K uh, King's Council, he used to practice in Singapore, actually, and he just posted that they, they won a case. He represented eight Torres Strait uh, Islanders, all right, um, who sued the Australian government before the United Nations Human Rights Committee for not having adequate climate change uh, measures to protect them from rising sea levels, storm surge, and climate changes that resulted in heavy rainfall disrupting their lives, personal lives, as well as their culture. And, and that's a very interesting development. So you will see increasingly more, more public interest uh, activists, chief among them, Klein Earth, for example, taking up these measures against companies as well as governments. Um, in recent times, you have seen two couple of uh, UK cases, for example, where Klein Earth tried to take out a shareholders' action, derivative action, suing uh, the shell directors and the board for not um, adapting uh, climate change policies and thereby, they say, uh, putting the company at risk. That failed. There was another attempt against the uh, university superannuation uh, scheme for, for the directors not divesting enough uh, and still relying too much on fossil fuels. That failed as well. But that's the UK, they move a bit slower. But who knows, uh, if you try somewhere else, you might succeed. So you need to have uh, officers who are aware of these things. And many companies now have chief sustainability officer. I would just like to add one more point because Legion, uh, Legion spoke about a movie, Let the Bullets Fly, which I think I saw maybe was yeah. set in the 1940s or 50s. Um, I want to talk about one other thing, which is cultural differences. And when you operate across borders in BRI countries, you really, really need to be aware of how people operate, how they think, and so on. It may seem cliche, but it does affect uh, the, your chances of disputes and whether you resolve them. And I mention that because right now I, I was just watching this Chinese drama starring uh, this famous actress Chao Li Ying. Um, I don't know how you pronounce the name in Chinese, Chao Li Ying. And, and this is about a young lady, young woman who very strong will, but believe in black and white, right and wrong, and believe in, no, she was just advised on the law. And she kept going up against the village head of rural China. So it's not cross-border, but clash of, of uh, mentalities between city and rural areas. And as I watched the program, I could actually see both sides, maybe because I'm getting old, I could identify with the village head. And, and the movie is a story of Sing Fu, or Sing Fu Tao, uh, Wan Xia, for those who are interested in looking it up. But what's interesting about that is it actually shows the clash of perspectives Whereas one side is always talking about right and wrong, legal rights, and so on. But you could actually sympathize with the other side, who is just trying to uh, do things in, in his own way, all right, and not, not thinking too much about the legality of it. 
and that can happen cross border as well. And, fi and finally, um, as a risk mitigation, of course, these are topics that all of you would have given to your clients, and that is pay careful attention to dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, we, we, I, I used to give the different topics on, on looking at those, and I often cite uh, Sun Tzu, Bing Fa, the art of war, right? Uh, Sun Tzu's art of war, which is that when you are considering operation or going into battle in another place, you need to know the terrain. You need, need to know the lie of the land, and in this case, the legal lie of the land, as well as the infrastructure and who the people are. And, and that's something you always need to bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're all going to put that movie on our to watch list now. <laughs> um, now, moving on to the key issues in international arbitration in China. What are the cultural and procedural considerations? And Lingsan, I know you touched on this already briefly, but what are these considerations in international arbitrations involving Chinese parties? And can you please share with us some practical tips? on preparing and presenting evidence governed by, uh, in arbitrations governed by Chinese law, which is a civil law system. So maybe Brenda, if, uh, you could please share with us. Oh, I think, and this is not unique to China, it's, it's across many civil law jurisdictions. It's <clears throat> those of us who come from common, <clears throat> sorry, frog. Um, those of us who come from common law backgrounds are used to corporates having document management po policies. Companies have whole policies on what documents to keep, what documents not to keep, how to keep them, uh, how to organize them. Because in common law litigation, we expect to produce documents. In civil law jurisdictions, you don't expect to, to produce documents. You definitely don't expect to produce them on a request from the other side, but you may not even expect to necessarily keep them yourself. And so one of the things that you will find or the, that I found probably most surprising about working with Chinese corporates is sometimes they'll come, they'll come to you and say, we just don't have those documents. And you're like, why? And they're like, well, the employee that used to keep that left the company, and so we wiped his laptop. And that's very common. The, the documents just disappear. And so if you're helping a client, it can be hard to build your case. If you're sitting as arbitrator, you have to understand that if the company is saying, you know, if, if one of the parties is saying, we just don't have that category of documents, they may actually be telling the truth, not because they shredded them, but because they just never kept them. And the flip side is also true. They may keep things that in a common law jurisdiction you would never keep. So, I, you know, I had, a, I had a case once where I was dealing with a European company that had a branch in Asia and they were respondent. It was defective equipment claim, huge dollar value in, at issue parent company was convinced the equipment was all fine, no problem. One of the specific document production requests was any third party evaluations of this equipment. Parent says, no, don't have any. You got to ask the branch. We ask the branch. Branch says, uh, you don't want to see it. And we're like, um, now we have to see it. Branch says, now nah, we'll just shred it. <laughs> no, 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 you do not shred it. We have to see it. Essentially, they had had third party evaluation of this equipment, not run through counsel, no way to claim privilege. It, we were going to have to hand it over. In big, bright red letters on the top of every page was a little header that said, this equipment is dangerous and can kill people. Oh, so we're like, um, well, we can buy you 48 hours. You have got to settle because you are going to lose. So. It's these types of things that you have to understand your corporate is operating from a different document management background and different understandings of what documents are and should be. So that would be my top tip. That's really fascinating. Thank you. So our next question is about the interim measures arrangement. So. China has an interim measures arrangement with Hong Kong, and this was similarly extended to Macau last year. So what has been the practical effect of this? 
And what does this spell for international arbitration lawyers in Singapore? In particular, do you feel that it would be harder for international arbitration lawyers here to work on Chinese disputes because Singapore doesn't have a similar arrangement with China? Legion? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, uh, nowadays in practice, we have seen a lot of this, you know, uh, we are doing Hong Kong arbitrations and typically uh, we will seek court order interim measures uh, in mainland Chinese court uh, under this uh, arrangement between mainland and Hong Kong. So for a Singapore arbitration, there's uh, no such, uh, uh, you know, assistance from the Chinese court. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, if the amendment of the PRC arbitration law is passed, uh, then we should continue providing, saying, you know, foreign institutions doing arbitration or, or having a, 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 a subcommission or division in China doing arbitration uh, can be registered with the local Department of Justice, which means those uh, foreign institutions will gain the national treatment status. Uh, so that uh, the Chinese court will order interim measures in support of uh, those uh, arbitrations that are seated in China. So in the future, this may not be, become a big problem uh, as long as this amendment is passed. Uh, see, see, for those who want to do CIEC arbitration but want to have assistance from the Chinese court, you can simply uh, say that this is a CIEC arbitration seated in China. So, Makes sense. so it, has, it will still have to be seated in China, right? That's yes, yes, yeah. Right. So otherwise, you have to reach a, a you encourage the Singaporean government to reach a judicial assistance treaty with the Chinese government, so you, you can get assistance uh, in a similar way. Uh, you can also seat it in Hong Kong. Yes, uh, then you need to. Would that be possible? <laughs> yeah, yeah. If that's, uh, uh, you know, CIAC open up in Hong Kong, then you need to have, uh, you, you need to be listed uh, on the DOJ's, you know, uh, list. Uh, because uh, once you are listed, you will be eligible to receive assistance from the Chinese court. Otherwise, you, you cannot. Uh. Okay. Well, in interesting development, and certainly is. Uh, it's a big plus for Hong Kong to have its arbitrations being assisted by court entry measures from China. And I think it's quite popular because I read that within a year, uh, it was introduced in 2019. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and within 2020, they had 37 applications. And so on. I'm sure there are a lot now. Uh, how would it affect the rest of the world arbitration practitioners elsewhere? I think to some extent, uh, People might like the idea when they choose an arbitration seat uh, with a Chinese party that they might consider whether you know, they should have it in China or Hong Kong because you might want to get an injunction uh, against that party. But this is something that you have to weigh in advance before the dispute arises so you can never know whether you need that or whether you still want to have some place that you perceive to be neutral and not a, is, is not the home ground of the Chinese party. Of course, uh, many countries apart from China, will grant interim injunctions in aid of arbitration seated outside their country. Some of them follow the ancestral model law, Article 17H, I think. Um, and also some of them will recognize interim measures ordered by the tribunal under Article 17J. Singapore um, will recognize emergency arbitrators orders or interim measures from other countries and treat them as if they are New York Convention awards. Then Section 12, uh, of the International Arbitration Act also permits Singapore courts to, to grant interim uh, measures for arbitration seated anywhere, but you have a threshold to cross to persuade the court why they should grant it rather than having you go to the tribunal. So there are, there are all kinds of, uh, of, of things that you'll look at when you're considering uh, your options. And of course, in emergency arbitrators orders from Singapore have been enforced in India, in the US. Um, without any problem. But China, I think you have to be aware, as I mentioned just now, going back again to Sun Tzu, the art of war, you need to be aware of the situation on the ground. Yeah. I think one thing you need to be aware is that uh, the Chinese court, when um, uh, giving decisions on interim measures, uh, they take a very straightforward approach. You just need to post security 
uh, they do not consider, you're generally speaking, they do not consider urgency, whether there will be irreparable harm, you know, whether there's a likelihood to win the case. So uh, if you are wrong in applying the interim measure, so you will be uh, liable for the losses caused to the other side. So, so I think for Hong Kong arbitration nowadays, it's much easier to get interim uh, measures from the mainland court than from the Hong Kong court or the, from the tribunal. So uh, that's uh, And the other thing just to, to highlight there is this isn't just against Chinese parties. The Chinese are, companies are using these measures to seize or, or, or to get injunctions over foreign owned assets in China. So it, it's going both ways. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much. So moving on to our next topic, which is on building a China focused arbitration practice. What steps can junior lawyers in Singapore take to develop expertise in international arbitrations involving Chinese parties? And perhaps, Charles, if you'd like to uh, address that question. Not that the rest of us are junior. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think what I would say is, I would echo what Lake San said earlier, which is uh, know your terrain. And, and how, how does one know the terrain? And, and I think uh, as lawyers, uh, it would come from having a comparative law uh, awareness. And if you talk about arbitrations having Chinese parties, uh, you, you can imagine that they are, you can categorize them in two kinds. One would be where there is a Chinese party and the dispute is governed by Chinese law. And in such a situation, you, would, you, you cannot escape having to know something about Chinese law. Uh, and, and, and one way to do that is to have some familiarity with uh, the ch concepts in Chinese law, for example, which you will find in, in, for example, the Chinese Civil Code. Uh, another kind of uh, category of uh, disputes involving Chinese parties would be where there's a Chinese party, but the dispute is governed by non-Chinese law, by some other legal system, like I mentioned earlier, Hong Kong law, English law, Singapore law, or something else. In that situation, it's still important, again, I would echo what Ling Sun mentioned earlier on about uh, knowing how your opponents think or how your clients think, it, it, depending on where the client where the Chinese party is, it could be on your side or the other side. And uh, there are many ways to uh, learn how, you know, like uh, uh, parties from who may be of a different nationality to you think uh, in terms of short and simple steps that, that perhaps uh, those in the audience can take. I would, I would say that one would be to read some books about these areas. And one example that I would give is a book by Michael Moser and Shen Bao called uh, Managing Belt and Road uh, Business Disputes. I believe Lee Jin has contributed to this book as well. And the other book that I would recommend would be Lee Jin's own book, uh, A Guide to the CTEC Arbitration Rules. Uh, so those are two quick steps. And apply for a job, really. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I think the next question is something that might be on at least some of our minds. How important is Mandarin language proficiency in international and arbitrations involving Chinese parties? And what is the required level of Mandarin language proficiency for such cases? And I think for CTEC arbitration, 90% uh, uh, cases are in Chinese with the other 10% may either be English language or uh, bilingual arbitration. For Hong Kong arbitration, I just checked the statistics today. Uh, last year in 2022, 11.3% cases is uh, Mandarin language arbitration, uh, and with 1.6% uh, uh, bilingual arbitration, which means uh, almost 90% of cases are only in English language. Uh, but I, I heard from uh, uh, people uh, from uh, HKIEC saying, you know, they have difficulty in finding, uh, you know, presiding arbitrator who has to be a third country national uh, that is fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, there are only a few choices. I, th I think um, well, one of the reasons that uh, you guys need to uh, study <laughs> Mandarin is that you are from Singapore. You are for a third country national for, you know, uh, mainland Chinese arbitration, for Hong Kong arbitration, and maybe other places. So uh, if your Mandarin is good enough, you will be future presiding arbitrators in those proceedings. <laughs> <laughs>
lots of potential in this room. So, um, Brenda, if I could also ask you to comment. Well, what a drunk one, Bhutan house. So, um, <laughs> uh, clearly, you can do it with just English. Um, I think there there are two aspects. I agree with the. It can be difficult to find a, 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 a neutral um, who is fluent in Mandarin if your clause provides for that. Um, I I had one case where we literally had a choice between four people because they also had to be on the CTAC list, and the other side had appointed one, and two of them were co had conflicts. So we had a choice of one. That was it. Um, so that that is key. But and I do think someone on your team, if you have a Chinese client, someone on your team has to be fluent in Mandarin, because you have to be able to speak with all of the witnesses, with corporates. Many of them will be, will be fluent in English, but you need someone who can communicate kind of on a day to day level um, with everyone else on the client team. But as, as Lee Jim said, many of these cases are in English. I have done, as when I was counsel, I did a number of CTAC cases. They were all in English. Um, so when you get into the large cases that involve an international party, English is going to be generally fine. One just piece of advice, um, tell all of your transactional colleagues that if you have a bilingual contract, pick a governing language. Don't have both languages equally enforced. I have a wonderful story of a $45 million comma where the comma in one language meant that you had to wait 40, uh, 45 days before you could go to arbitration. And in the other language meant that you had to go to arbitration within 45 days or you lost jurisdiction. <laughs> it was completely incompatible. We argued this at the arbitration on set aside and on enforcement in seven countries. Please have a governing language clause. That's really amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, now, specifically on working on Chinese uh, arbitrations, I was wondering if the panel could comment and share any personal experiences or advice that you have for junior lawyers in the room um, on working on arbitrations involving Chinese parties, perhaps apart from what you've already shared. Is there anything further you'd like to, to add? Well, still uh, on the language point, uh, you uh, sometimes it's an you you mentioned Mandarin. Mandarin is a good word. You don't use Chinese because Chinese we ha there are different uh, Chinese languages. I have seen one case is in which is a Hong Kong case. I was a it's a Chinese language. I was a presiding arbitrator, and uh, the one of the parties they engage a Hong Kong barrister who only speak Cantonese. So in that arbitration, we have interpretation between Mandarin and. Uh, Cantonese, so it's a waste of time and money. Right, that makes sense. So, just coming to our final topic, which is the future of international arbitration in China, I'd now like to ask the panelists if they could please share with us one line each on how they see the future of international arbitration in China. Li Jun, please, can we start with you? Oh uh, well, I, I think uh, as mentioned, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, China, uh, we have uh, so many institutions, uh, but not every uh, institution does international arbitration. At least there are a few who does arbitration, international arbitrations. So if you look at the caseload number, it's a big number. So CTEC last year has uh, over uh, uh, 4,000 cases, and the Beijing Arbitration Commission has over 6,000 cases. So uh, for uh, Shenzhen Court of International Arbitration, probably 10,000 cases. So um, that means to say there are a uh, huge potential for everyone to tackle. So if you um, are interested in doing China-related arbitration, I, I guess it's inevitable that you will come across China-related uh, uh, arbitration anyway. But maybe you can consider um, you know, uh, working in China either in an international firm or in a firm, red circle firm like us <laughs> for a number of years. Uh, and uh, Charles' success, uh, you know, is uh, partly uh, attributable to the working experience with us. I think you can uh, follow his example. 
Thank you. Ling Sun, anything to add? Well, it's an aspiration, and my aspiration is um, both for China and other countries that arbitration practice and laws will get to the stage where we can say arbitration without borders. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Brenda? There's something very similar, which is that I think if you look at the past, there were big divergences for between how arbitration um, proceedings were managed, say at CTAC as opposed to SEAC or ICC. And I think those differences are shrinking. And I think we're, what we're coming toward is a global standard that all of the institutions are headed toward. And so I think we're what we're seeing and will continue to see is a, an internationalization of arbitrations involving all of the countries in this region. Thank you. Charles? One sentence about uh, arbitration in China. I would say that uh, every, every small step for China is uh, one giant leap for the world. <laughs> Just that. Thank you. So uh, we're now at the audience Q&A round. We have a couple of questions uh, on the Slido. So what is the future of ODR in China, especially with respect to cross-border MSME disputes? And should institutions be focusing on ODR now? I think one of the things that we haven't touched on, which is going to be vital in the future, and this is only a partial answer to this question, is data protection laws and how they're being rolled out in China, because I think they're, one of the things that we're seeing is that there is a lot of movement now on what you can take outside of the borders of China. And that is going to affect all of these questions, um, particularly online dispute resolution, because where's your border? Hmm. Legion? Well, uh, ODR or uh, ADR, you know, they are quite popular uh, in China. If you ask the institutions, they will say yes. We have been doing online arbitration for many, many years. CTEC started to do this back in two, uh, 2000 when they have this uh, uh, domain name dispute resolution system, which is basically an uh, online uh, uh, mechanism for resolving domain name disputes. Uh, so, um, but it, uh, like uh, Brenda said, the data protection become a big issue. So uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, also happens in relation to uh, document production. So one of the interesting topic we have been discussing is, uh, uh, you know, if uh, the foreign uh, arbitral tribunal order, uh, you know, production of documents, would uh, uh, the uh, Chinese party argue that there is uh, legal impediment to uh, so that they are, they should be allowed not to produce under uh, uh, Article uh, nine point two uh, or or uh, any other. Would that be a uh, uh, over over burdensome task to produce such documents? So China has uh, implementing uh, has been implementing uh, legislations on uh, personal privacy and uh, and. Uh, uh, what else? Uh, cyber security since uh, a few years back, and uh, it is quite unclear at the moment whether for international arbitration there will be such an obstacle. But people, lawyers, tend to give very conservative advice. If you look at those provisions, it only says for uh, uh, court proceeding in other countries, uh, you need to go through the judicial assistance uh, treaty procedures in order to gain permission from the Chinese authorities uh, for release of such uh, uh, information. But for arbitration, it's unclear. Thank you for sharing that. So I'll now open it to the floor in terms of anyone who wants to raise their hands and ask a question. Now is your time to do that. I'll come around and pass you the mic. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Violet from Northern Rose. I just want to thank the panelists for the, the really interesting discussion. Um, I think I have two questions. The first one is more for Li Jun. Uh, so in China, there is a phenomenon of choosing uh, none. So it's really hard to enforce um, a, a judgment. Do you encounter similar problems enforcing an arbitral award? 
and how much of your work is enforcement uh, versus uh, CTAG arbitration? Um, yes, so that's the first question. The second question, I suppose, is more for Charles, because uh, you're a Singaporean and you have worked in China. I'm Chinese, I've not worked in China. Uh, so how do you find um, the cultural difference um, in terms of the Chinese arbitration firm uh, culture versus that in Singapore? Thank you. So, um, the first question, uh, well, you know, uh, I think uh, the difficulty in enforcement is generally perceived uh, as uh, one of the big issues uh, in uh, the legal procedure in China. But I think it's primarily in relation to the uh, enforcement of a court judgments rather than uh, arbitral wars. Uh, as Lansen uh, mentioned, uh, the Supreme People's Court uh, has established this reporting mechanism which requires the lower courts to report to up, all the way up to the Supreme Court in order to uh, get its approval to make any decision um, against arbitration. It's either invalidity of uh, arbitration agreement or non-enforcement of uh, the ar arbitral award. So basically, this system has effectively um, centralized the decision-making process in relation to uh, 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 enforcement of uh, arbitral award. But I do agree that uh, there is a di distinction between enforcement and actual execution. So even if you bypass uh, this enforcement stage and the court order in favor of the enforcement, uh, then that does not necessarily mean you uh, will get the access, uh, you will get the money back, because by that time, uh, 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 um, the uh, opposing party may have a try all the efforts to dissipate the assets. So that's why intermarriage is so important. <laughs> yeah, I think the, 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 the problem is less getting enforcement. The Chinese courts are actually pretty, pretty good at that. It's finding the assets. Yes. So again, talk to your transactional colleagues because the time you should be thinking about the assets is when you're entering the deal. If your counterparty is named NUCO at three o'clock in the morning on the day you signed the deal, I don't care how good your arbitration award is, you're never gonna be able to enforce it because there aren't any assets there to enforce against. Find assets you, that you can ring fence and find them when you enter the deal. Second question is for Charles, but I think we just have to acknowledge that both his past and present bosses are here. So we can <laughs> He cannot speak honestly in comparing the two law firms. <laughs> uh, I think I can. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, say that uh, China is a very big place and it has a huge population. And the firms over there are very large. I think Zhongdun has more than 2,000 lawyers at the moment. And, and uh, whereas I think the larger Singapore firms are, fact, uh, are, are just a fraction of that uh, in terms of talking about Singapore domestic firms. Uh, and when when Young lawyers are working on very large and complex international arbitrations. I think that uh, the nature of the work is the same in that it's large, it's complex. There's a lot of uh, information that needs to be uh, synthesized. There are a lot of documents that need to be processed and understood. And in that sense, uh, what's required in both, in both in Singapore and in China is, uh, is uh, hard work and determination to be able to sit down, to be able to go through thousands of documents and to be able to uh, do that and, uh, and, 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 and arrange them in a way that uh, would be beneficial for the client in, 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 in the presentation of a case. Uh, yeah, so I think that's what I would say. Thank you. Just before we end, we actually have one question from a virtual attendee. His name is Godwin Tan, and he says he's a Singaporean practicing international arbitration. He asks, have Chinese investors' successes in high-profile investment treaty cases, uh, example, Zhongshan, Fucheng, and Nigeria, given rise to more interest and awareness of the investment treaty regime and a greater willingness to tap on treaties to resolve investment disputes? Maybe Legion, if you'd like to take that question. Well, um... 20 years ago, when I studied at Berkeley, I learned from uh, Professor Karen about the treaty arbitration. Uh, he, uh, I was a research assistant with him. Uh, you know, um, so the job is to find the only true 
uh, rules, uh, the specific provisions of the ANSI rules that has been used in NAFTA cases. So when I came back to talk to my colleagues about uh, uh, investment arbitrage, nobody knows it. Uh, <laughs> 10 years ago, uh, the, uh, there are seminars uh, where people start to uh, talk about uh, investment arbitration, exit arbitration. Now, uh, standing at this point, uh, there are uh, a number of cases filed against the Chinese government, and there have been more cases filed by the Chinese investors. So, uh, in terms of uh, awareness of uh, this uh, option, I think uh, a lot of people are aware of it, but they just uh, do not have uh, the, uh, I wouldn't say do not have the gut, but uh, the, uh, it's difficult for them to make a decision. They usually say, if I take on the government of another state, I better talk to MAFCOM, uh, Minister of Commerce or Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, in order to at least to get their endorsement. And this is not only for SOEs, even for private companies, they have this mindset. Uh, so uh, that uh, may more or less slow down or, uh, or make their uh, uh, um, confidence disappear you know, in the process. But I think it's a matter of, uh, 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 still a matter of uh, growing familiarity. If they see others, you know, like the Zhongshan Fortran case, if they see others uh, uh, doing those cases and uh, get a good result, and that result has been uh, enforced, then I think they, are, they will be uh, showing more interest. Uh, the answer is yes. And uh, for the Chinese government side, the Chinese government is uh, very supportive of uh, uh, ISDS because one of the reasons is that the Chinese government so far has not lost any case that have been brought up by foreign investors. Uh, and I think one of the things that it's important to remember is that there's been a sea change in the Chinese government approach to treaties. So if you looked at first generation treaties, they were limited to um, the jurisdiction over the amount of compensation for expropriation. By now we're at third generation treaties that are very broad. They cover all forms of investment. And that shift has been because the government is basically, as you say, taking a gamble that it needs, it, it, it's more desirous of protecting Chinese investors investing in scary foreign places than it is worried about being sued at home in China by foreign investors. Because as a general rule, Chinese law is actually pretty stable. And so you don't have the same kind of massive swings that lead to treaty cases that you would find, say, in Nigeria. Thank you. Um, and so with that, we will draw the panel discussion to a close. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And also, I'd like to thank our esteemed panelists again for taking the time to share their insights and perspectives with us. And I invite everyone to thank them in the usual way. Thank you.